Welcome to Concept in Medicine. In today's tutorial, we are going to be looking at bacterial vaginosis. But before then, let me take this opportunity to answer the previous question I asked in the last edition. And that is, which substances are absorbed in the terminal ileum? And the answer to that question is vitamin B12 and bowel salts. All right. Let's move ahead and look at today's topic. Today we are going to be having a look at bacterial vaginosis. Bacterial vaginosis is so called because the word bacteria connotes to the fact that this particular condition is caused by bacteria. And we are saying vaginosis because there is no specific inflammatory response in this particular condition. Formerly, bacterial vaginosis was referred to as non-specific vaginitis. Why? Because there is no particular one microorganism involved. The microorganisms were a lot. But with time, it was realized that bacteria was involved. Therefore, the name changed to bacterial vaginosis. And you should also know that bacterial vaginosis is mostly caused by Gardnerella vaginalis. And we know that it is not the only organism involved as the causative organism of bacterial vaginosis. There are several of them, but it is the most dominant bacteria involved. And because several microorganisms are involved in the cause of bacterial vaginosis, bacterial vaginosis is referred to as a polymicrobial synergistic infection. With that, let's talk about the associated organisms. For the associated bacteria, we can think of lactobacillus. Why are we saying lactobacillus? If you look at the normal vagina flora, the most dominant organism is lactobacilli. And the lactobacilli, what do they do? They produce hydrogen peroxide and also lactic acid which guide against the invasion of other microorganisms. And if you look at that very carefully, lactobacilli is the most dominant in the vagina and at the same time with other flora, they keep the vagina in the balance of the microflora. Anytime there is a disturbance or an imbalance to the normal vaginal flora such that the number of lactobacilli reduces and the number of organisms such as Gardnerella vaginalis increases, bacterial vaginosis is the resultant cause. So let's talk about the associated bacteria. For the associated bacteria, we made mention of lactobacilli. We can also talk about the mobilancus. Then we can talk about the anaerobes. Which anaerobes are we looking at? We can talk about the bacteroids, Peptostreptococcus, Fuxobacterium and Ubacterium and the Rex. We can also think of Prevotella as an associated bacteria, Uroplasma realiticum, Mycoplasma hominis, and also Streptococcus viridans. These together, in association with Gardnerella vaginalis, are responsible for the cause of bacterial vaginosis. Let's move ahead and talk about the risk factors. With bacterial vaginosis, multiple sexual partners is one of the risk factors of bacterial vaginosis. And you should pay attention that bacterial vaginosis is not a sexually transmitted infection. Why? Because the criteria for a condition to be classified as a sexually transmitted infection is that the source should not be associated with an endogenous flora. And if we take bacterial vaginosis, the source of the infection is in the endogenous vagina flora. Hence, bacterial vaginosis cannot be classified as a sexually transmitted infection. Let's move ahead. With the multiple sexual partners, it doesn't only have to do with a man and a woman. It could be resulting from a woman-to-woman -woman sexual intercourse. 
because where is the source? It is in the endogenous vaginal flora. All right. The next risk factor is cigarette smoking. Why? Because cigarette smoking would reduce the amount of oxygenated blood being supplied to the vaginal mucosa. And as a result, microorganisms tend to have the needed substrate for their metabolism, which helps them to proliferate easily. And with that too, the Gardnerella vaginalis is able to form a biofilm that coats the vagina mucosa, creating a chance for the opportunistic bacteria to invade and proliferate, leading to bacteria vaginosis. The next risk factor we want to talk about, recent antibiotic use. The use of antibiotics tends to create an imbalance between the normal vaginal microbiota. And with that, the useful flora tends to get eliminated, giving credence to the violent ones to take hold of the vagina. And that could cause bacterial vaginosis. The next, vaginal douching. When we say douching, simply refers to the use of water or detergents uh, to clean the vagina. And in trying to do that, you may collect microorganisms from the vulva all the way into the vagina. The next one, intrauterine device usage, and that could also create a good microenvironment for organisms to proliferate. Let's move ahead and talk about the clinical presentation. With a clinical presentation, the most common is vaginal odor. And the vaginal odor in bacterial vaginosis is fishy in nature and is most prevalent during sexual intercourse. Why? Because during sexual intercourse, the semen that is released from the man is already alkaline in nature. So the introduction of the semen into the vagina is able to liberate the volatile amine from the vagina discharge, which gives off the fishy odor. The next presentation is vagina discharge. And with that, the discharge is mildly or moderately increase. Normally, physiologically, you can have certain discharges which are uh, usual, but in bacterial vaginosis, the discharge is increased and it does not only come without an order. It is considered as a malodorous discharge, which comes with a fishy odor, as we earlier on explained. The next one, presentation, we can think of dysuria. As for dysuria, it's not so common. That is painful maturation. Dyspareunia is another presentation, and it's also not so common. Then again, there could be vaginal irritation. That's vaginal pruritus, itching, itching in the vagina. In some certain groups of patients, they present asymptomatically. They do not present with symptoms. Let's move ahead and talk about the diagnostic criteria of bacterial vaginosis. With the diagnostic criteria, we are going to talk about three of them, out of which one is the most commonly used. Let's start by looking at the one that is most commonly used. That is the AMSEL criteria. For the AMSEL criteria, it is rapid, it is easily accessible, and also it does not require experts in acquiring the various components of the criteria. So currently worldwide, AMSEL criteria is the most commonly used criteria in the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. Let's talk about the components of the criteria. It tells you that before this can be done, the vagina discharge should be collected as a sample. It can be collected using a high vaginal swab or what we call endocervical swab. For the components, the vaginal pH is greater than 4.5. Bear in mind that the most dominant component of the vaginal normal microbiota is lactobacilli, and they produce lactic acid to keep the vagina acidic, to keep the vagina medium at the pH of 3.5 to 4.5. Any pH exceeding 4.5 is considered abnormal. 
So that is the first component of the criteria. The next one is presence of greater than 20% glue cells, glue cells on wet mount microscopy. The question is what are the glue cells? When we say glue cells, simply they are vaginal epithelial cells with adherent gram negative Garnerella vaginalis on their surface. That is what we call clue cells. And the presence of clue cells is the most specific finding for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. So the presence of greater than 20% clue cells on wet mount microscopy is another component of the AMSEL criteria. The next one is what we call the positive whiff or amine test. And how is this achieved? It is achieved by the addition of 10% potassium hydroxide to the vaginal discharge. And upon addition, a fishy odor is produced. That is what we call the positive whiff or amine test. The last component is the homogeneous thin gray or white discharge adherent to the vaginal walls. For the interpretation of the AMSA criteria, we will say that the presence of at least three criteria is diagnostic of bacterial vaginosis. Let's move ahead and look at the next criteria. For the next criteria, is referred to as the Spiegel criteria. For the Spiegel criteria, it was the Odin criteria considered as a gold standard. But with time, the gold standard criteria changed to another criteria. So currently, the Spiegel criteria is not the gold standard. Let's talk about the Spiegel criteria. For the Spiegel criteria, it tells you that if on gram stain, greater than or equal to five Gardnerella vaginalis morphotypes together with greater than or equal to five other morphotypes and this morphotype what are we talking about we are talking about the gram positive cocus we are talking about the small gram negative rods and we are also talking about the curved gram variable rods or fusiforms when we say curved gram variable it means there is no specific gram stain whether it's negative or positive it is unknown that's what we call kept gram variable routes then finally in addition to the above with gram stain there's less than five lactobacilli morphotypes per oil emission field and if it is like that we will say it is positive of bacteria vaginosis so the speaker criteria tends to go with the gram stain where you have greater than or equal to five Gardnerella vaginalis morphotypes plus greater than or equal to five other morphotypes. Then in addition to that, the presence of less than five lactobacilli morphotypes on an oil emission field. That is diagnostic of bacterial vaginosis. But with the speaker criteria, it is no longer considered as the gold standard. So currently, it's really done. Let's move ahead and talk about the last criteria. For the last criteria, we are talking about what we call the Nugent criteria. It is currently the gold standard criteria for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis as compared to the answer criteria. The new gen criteria was developed in the year 1991 as compared to the AMSEL criteria which was developed in 1983. And currently, once again, the new gen criteria is the gold standard criteria for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. Let's look at the criteria. For this criteria, it is also used to quantify the bacteria through gram stain. And with that, let's look at the criteria. With the Nugen criteria, it tends to look at certain bacteria, that is the lactobacilli, the Gardnerella vaginalis or the bacteroids, and also the mobilincus. In that case, if you are looking at the lactobacillus, 
It can be graded with a score of 0 to 4. The Bacteroids, or the Gardnerella vaginalis, a score of 0 to 4. The Mobilincus, a score of 0 to 2. So the total score in that regard should give us 10. Then the interpretation is, if you have a score of 0 to 3, it is considered normal. If you have a score of 4 to 6, it's considered an intermediate bacterial count. And if you have a score of 7 to 10, it is diagnostic of bacterial vaginosis. Then once again, know that the Nugent criteria is the gold standard investigation for bacterial vaginosis. All right, so again, you should know that the most common method or criteria for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis is the AMSEL criteria. And the gold standard is the Nugent criteria. The presence of greater than 20% clue cells on wet mount microscopy and the positive whiff or a test in the AMSEL criteria do matches with the Nugent criteria. But the Nugent criteria is considered the gold standard criteria for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. Let's move ahead and look at the complications and the treatment. With the complications, we can think of chorioamnionitis, premature aperture membranes, low birth weight, preterm labor, high incidence of pelvic infections after abortions, endometritis, urinary tract infections, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, increased risk of ectopic pregnancy, chronic pelvic pain and infertility. And with the treatment of bacterial vaginosis, the first line choice of treatment or the drug of treatment is oral metronidazole. And the second line is oral clindamycin. I believe we've learned something new today. Before we end the session, I have a question for you. The question is what is the biomarker for preterm labor. Kindly leave your answers in the commentary session so that next time I would comment on the answer in our next tutorial. Kindly make sure to subscribe to my channel, like, share, and also comment the concept you would like to see in my next tutorial. My name is Dr. Dell, and this is Concept in Medicine. Bye-bye.